and welcome to this video that I have entitled From World of Observation to Geodata Schema. So to understand what I mean by this, let's take a look at a diagram that we have seen earlier. So in the video about how one structures one project, I had this diagram where we have our world of observation that we study through the lens of purpose and a priori knowledge, which then generates our world of discourse. And based on that, we can collect data ourselves or we can use existing data. So what this video will focus on is this version of it. So we have our world of observation, our lens, our world of discourse. But this time I have made these yellow dots hollow, indicating that there's no data in it. It's just a schema. It's just saying which layers or feature classes, as they are called, or which attributes there are in it. So there's no data, so it's just a structure. That's what we call the schema. So this is what we're going to look at, how this flow works. If uh, we think of uh, this picture by Peter Bruegel, the elder, so hunters in the snow, and use this as our world of observation. And we can see lots of different phenomena in this world of observation. There's some phenomena here, there's some phenomena there, there's some other ones there. I'm not giving them names because that is really first the next step. So at the moment I am just sensing the phenomena. The next step in our world of discourse is then to decide how we look upon these phenomena. What should we call them? How should we classify them? How should we organize them? So there we have two different approaches. We have entity types, which are objects or well-defined things, discrete things, um, such as trees, buildings, roads, things like that. And then we have property fields that is something that varies continuously through space, such as elevation, air pressure, temperature, and so on. If we uh, look at our world of observation, we could say, hmm, one of these things here, yes, let's call them trees. So we can, in our world of This course talk about a feature or entity type called trees, which have some properties, which could be the height of the tree and the species of the tree, whatever properties. If it, if it was buildings, it could be the height of the building, the use of the building, if it was roads, class of the road, the width of the road, and so on. So each of our entity types describes a similar phenomena. So we decide that these and these and these phenomena are of the same type. And in this case, we call them trees. So it is the concept trees that we decide on in our world of discourse. It's not the individual trees, it is the concept of trees, how we define it and how we describe it, which attributes or properties it has. We could also look at this, um, we have some alpine mountains and some Flemish lowlands down here and some hills around here. So we could look at a, another entity type that we could call terrain. And then we could say that, okay, this area here would have a attribute, let's call it level. 
So this will have the attribute label of lowland, this one could have the attribute value of foothills, and this one could have the attribute value of alpine mountains. So th these two entity types, they differ. These are what we call discrete objects. There's a tree, there's a tree, there's a tree. We define what a tree is and then we go out and find the individual tree. When we talk about things like terrain, we call them categorical entity types or categorical partitioning. So basically we take some attribute combination. In this case, for instance, this the height in meters above sea level and say if it's less than let's say 50 let's call it lowland from 50 to 200 we'll call it foothills and for 200 to 1000 we'll call it alpine or you know this from soil soil is normally classified based on the amount of sand and clay and loom um, so there's different classification systems that come into place. And so these are not, you know, we can't see and define the object here. It's only through some classification of another property that we can identify. So we have entity types, we have discrete or object entity types, and we have those that are generated through a classification or a categorical entity type. Finally, we have these property fields. Um, I've tried to display in these strange lines. What I tried to do with this was to indicate that it was something that varies continuous through space. That could be, for instance, elevation measured in meters above sea level. So we have, um, if this is some Flemish, it might be minus two, minus three, minus four, uh, zero, five, four, and 10, and 50, and a thousand up here. So that is something that varies continuously through space. So we represent them as property fields. So we have basically a gradient of things here. So we have from objects, discrete, well-defined objects, through categorical entities, something that is defined, not, you can't see the borders directly in the landscape. You do it through a classification of several attributes. And then finally, something that is completely continuous, which would, could be the elevation. So these three types of modeling we can use when we describe our world of discourse. So any world of discourse in this geospatial context has these three, okay, one or more of these three types of representation. So are object entity types or categorical entity types or property fields. And the entity types have attributes. The property field only has one attribute, namely the property that varies. So that's our world of this course and how we describe it. And of course, we have to go into how we define these things, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Finally, we have our schema. So this is how we represent things in our geodatabase. So we think, okay, here, we typically use the word feature class. So often a feature class is a entity type, but not necessarily. Um, we can also choose to represent things as raster layers. So these are what I generally call storage strategies. So you can ask store things as a vector or raster. I am talked about this in the video introduction to mapping and there's, I also got a text on it uh, in, the, in the notes underneath the video. So these are basically two different storage strategies. 
and typically entity types become feature classes and property fields become um, master layers, but not necessarily. Um, or, and often um, property fields are measured as points or as lines. So they will be represented first as feature class, and then they might be converted through some interpolation into raster. But feature entity types are typically feature classes. Of course, we, you can transform between the two if you wish, but th that is the basics. And what is called properties here, we often call attributes um, in the feature class. So in our world of observation, we have phenomena. In our world of discourse, we have entity types and property fields. And in our geodata schema, we have feature classes and raster layers. So they are the different namings or more or less the same type, but seen at different levels of abstraction. This goes a wee bit further. So um, when we talk about the schema, we, um, there are some additional things we have to register. So for a feature class, we decide which type of geometry is it. So a feature class in most software can only be on a point, a line, or a polygon. There are software packages, geodatabases, Postgres, for instance, that supports feature classes that are a mixture of points, lines, and polygons. So that's, there's no rule as such, but in general, QGIS, ArcGIS Pro, and so on, they have each feature class consist of one type of geometry. Then you also have to specify how the feature class, the data in the feature class is stored in getting the introduction video to mapping and in my tech done vector data. That vector data is also always just points, uh, just points as a point or points connected as lines or point connected at li as lines that encompass or encircle areas, polygons. So uh, there's always the, the basic data of the location is always a point. And how that point reference to a location on the surface of the Earth, that is what we call the coordinate reference system. So there's different, there's hundreds, literally, different ways of doing this. Um, the two common ones, and at least if you are in Denmark, we have this 25832, which is the European datum, and then UTM zone 32, and we have this 4336, which is the VGS, which is a global latitude longitude representation. So these are, I guess, the two common ones in Denmark. If you're in another country, this one will not probably not be used, and it'll probably be something else as your local, local UTM. So a feature class has additional properties, namely which type of geometry is in it, or does it use, so points, lines, polygons, and how are the coordinates in the feature class reference to locations on the Earth, which is what we call the coordinate reference system. Each attribute of our feature class then has a data type or a domain. Um, so is it a text? Is it an integer, so a whole number? Is it a decimal value? Is it a date? Is it time, blob? Blob just means binary large object, so that's picture, video, any object that is just stored there so you can access it. Um, when you choose your software, for instance, if you are using QGIS, you probably would be using a geo package, and they have some specific data types. So 
integers using this and that amount of bytes and so on. So at this level, I would probably just call them domains. So text, integers, decimal values, date, time, and blobs are the main types of domains. And we then have decided on which type of software we're using. We can be specific and talk about how the stock, how the data is stored in the bits and the bytes. But at this level, when we're just talking about any specific software, these are the main types. That's basically it. Um, so we had our world of observation, we had our lens, we have our world of discourse, and our schema. What's really important is this part, our documentation. So before you start on a specific software, being it a geo package or whatever, and start creating your data, collecting your data, it's a really good idea to document your world of discourse and your schema. Um, in complex situations, you can have different layers here. So we talk about logical models and digital models and so on. But in this, let's say in the most common, the not too complex world, we um, would document these two together. So we will document both our schema and our world of discourse. And to help you do that, I, um, I've created a little template that I use, and it's also linked in, um, in the description. And it looks something like this. So um, first of all, we, uh, oh, we have to start at the beginning. So um, we specify what is the purpose. So just remember that you know, data collected for the purpose of um, reducing pollutants will have one way of looking at agriculture, while data collected with the purpose of managing subsidies for agriculture will have another way. So even though they have the same subject, a world of observation, same phenomena, they will probably have different worlds of this course. So think about and specify your purpose so people know why this data has been collected. When people, so and this is, you know, typically GIS people work in some organization and there might be someone higher up in the organization that needs to understand what type of data they have. So this is why. Then we have our entity types, remember we had two types, entity types. We had those that were categorical and we had those that were objects. The way each entity type we have, is get specify a name, we give a description of it. So, and especially if, um, if your entity type is a complex one. So I have here a bus stop, which is a, you might think a simple thing, what is really a bus stop? Is it just the, the shelter here? Is it the shelter and the rubbish bin? Is it the pavement? Is it part of the bicycle path that is outside it? Is it the information standard? So what is really, how should we delimit our and define our bus stop? So start out with some description of it saying, okay, especially in these type of complex entities such as a bus stop which really consists of other things um, it's important to have a clear definition of what it is it's also really good here to have a photograph to illustrate what it is so a a entity type description and an entity type name then you need to consider the temporality of it how long time is this bus stop going to stay there? Oh, that's probably going to stay there for years. But there are things that are seasonal, ice cream stands or bathing facilities in the harbor or 
different things are seasonal so they're only there in the summer and disappear in the winter time or something can be following a rhythm of the day so we have typically we have queues and lots of cars in rush hour and more quiet roads in the other time or something that follows the rhythm of the week so lots of bicycles in front of shops on weekdays not that many bicycles in front of shops in the weekend so whatever you work with think about the temporality of that entity is it something that is constantly there or something that has a pattern to it and of course that you know we're not necessarily having to map all possibilities but it's important to think about what is this temporality because that might guide you in how you want to collect the data the limitation basically we have the two types we've talked about the tangible so the object tree car house whatever we have the categorical or classified ones and then have, we have another one which i didn't mention before um but things that are by definition um municipality borders uh postal zip code borders whatever so lots of different things out there that are delimited by definition so you just specify how is this delimited so this bus stop here would be a tangible one although it is complex then i have something in blue and things are in blue it indicates that it is part of the schema so in the schema we have to specify uh, what is geometry is it remember we had that in the feature class schema so we specify is it a point is it a line or is it a polygon and we also specify what is the preferred coordinate reference system so bus stops in Denmark would probably be in this 25832 uh, coordinate reference system if there's something that was globally so we're doing a mapping of global bus stops we will probably use the VGS so the 40 the 43 36 um reference then we have to specify a minimum mapping unit so probably all bus stops there but if it was something like um habitats uh or houses buildings um how small is a building before it's a building that's what we call our minimum mapping unit so a dog house or a playhouse it's probably too small to be classified as a building so typically we have a lower limit to the size of things before it will be registered so that's what we call the mapping unit and think about it, it has really a lot of effect um, especially if when we're working with ecosystems um, habitats then defining your mapping unit your minimum mapping unit is really important along the same way is our desired spatial precision so how precise are we in the delimitation of it you know does it matter if we know that the bus stop is at this location plus minus 10 meters or do we have to have it precise with in centimeters so that is our desired spatial position if it's if we have considered our temporality of our bus stop we probably also have to need to consider the position of the temporality so how precisely do i have to be when i specify when that bus stop was there is it okay to say well it was there sometime in year 2020 or do I have to say it was there at this the 3rd of August 2020 at 7 a.m. or whatever so you need to decide what is it you know how precise are you also with the temporality of the things 
if it has importance, of course. All of these things are, let's say, um, reminders. Things you know, but many of you just doing this skip, but they are there to remind you, oh, well, might be a good idea just to think about this. Spatial constraints. So, um, are, um, are cars allowed to be on top of cars? Are bus stops allowed to be? So, may one bus stop overlap another bus stop? Or does a bus stop have to be on a road or does it have to be on land? There's lots of different spatial constraints that can be important. Um, does every, um, if you have a, um, our case of our terrain with lowland foothills and mountains, does every location have to be in one of those classes or can there be unclassified areas? So this is what we mean by spatial constraints. It, are there rules about where things can be or is it okay that there are places where there's no objects? That is a spatial constraint. So, um, look, look, look. Now we talk about how we have, so we, before we said, the limitation is that a tangible, is it a classification or is it by definition? Now we have to specify how is this the limitation? So um, how do we define a bus stop? That's what we write down here. So we will say something about the entire area, including the air covered by info stand, a rubbish bin, a shelter, and all areas connecting these, or whatever we decide. There's lots of different, um, it, it, it is a bit of an art doing these specifications. So uh, there's a link here to um, British Ordnance Survey in U UK, um, where there's uh, how they do with their, some of their maps, and the Danish one um, for how this due Denmark um classification so here we can see how we classify a building and a cemetery and a roundabout in Danish. So so the so English one, Danish one. Um if it's a classification we should mention how this classification is. So here I have a a soil diagram so we can see how many percent of different fractions of the soil decide which type of soil it is. So some form of classification diagram or whatever we use to specify our classification. And if it is done by definition, so it would typically be a law. So in Denmark, the municipality law of 2000. And, and I think the last modification of where the borders of the Danish municipalities were. So specify how which rules or how we define our entity types by in here. Of course here, again here, we have to talk about the temporality of the limitation. So I had talked about the temporality of the entity before. So we can have a car and when that's lifespan after 20 years, then that car disappears. Okay, that's the light. That is the temporality of the car. But that car can move around. So it's the limitation. It's location data changes at a much shorter time interval. So consider the temporality of the, the limitation, especially if you have um, lakes that grow and shrink through the seasons, lots of different variations in delimitation temporality. Buildings, yeah, they probably stay put. Um, for each of our properties of our entity type, just again specify the property name, so tree height, species, so on. <clears throat> Let me specify the role or the intended role of that property. There are basically two intended roles that are 
properties that are intended, intended to be categorical. So if we have an entity type of roads, we might have a property specifying the road type that is intended to be a categorical property. So we have motor roads, main roads, by roads, cycle paths, dirt tracks. So a, a type attribute of property. And then we have these properties that are considered to be descriptive. So the width of the road, um, the, the the, the height of the layering of the road, whatever, um, the number of vehicles passing an hour, whatever you have of descriptive things, the height of the tree. So those are, um, so properties have typically different roles, categorical or descriptive. Short description of what it is. So this was just a rule of it. <clears throat> this is what it is. So what, how do we mean the height of a building? Is it to the highest point, including the chimney? Is it to halfway up the roof to where the roof starts? So what is that height? How do we define it? And then they have a domain or a data type. So is it a text? Is it an integer? Is it a decimal number? Is it a date? Is it a blob? What type of data is it? And finally, again, we have also uh, temporality on properties. So um, temperature could varies over the day. Sea level rate varies with the tide. Um, number of cars per hour varies the day, time of day. So many properties are not constant. They have a inherent temporality in them. And it's a really good idea to think about that. As I mentioned earlier, we had this case of um, bicycles in front of shops. If, if the number of bicycles standing in front of a shop was a property we we're looking at, then that will probably be higher in the opening hours of the shop than in the closed hours of the shop. So if we just ignore that, and then some shops we went out and counted bicycles at night, some shops we counted bicycles at day, and then we will get something that maybe not be that useful. So important to think about these things. Say, okay, hmm, before I start doing, so this is very much a help to how you are going to do data collection later, if that's what you're going to do. So that was all the things about entity types. Then we have our property fields. They have more or less the same. So it has a name, it has a description, it has a spatial position. So when we say that the elevation is 2.6 meters, do we mean exactly at this location or is it plus minus 10 centimeters or plus minus 20 centimeters in our location of course we also have a attribute so a value position so we have a a a, a, um, a temporal position also so if it is a, a property that is so a temperature was it temperature Last year, was it last year in the spring? Was it last year in the summer? Last year in the winter? Or just sometime last year? So what is, um, how precise do we have to be in specifying the temporal element of our measurements? Method of data acquisition. So how are we going to go out and collect the data? Is it going to be point measurements that you're going to do interpolation of? If it, is it a data set from a satellite, from a drone? What, what, how is this property field going to be created? Most property fields are created are from a sensor that generates property fields, such as satellites or aerial photographs, or through an interpolation of point lines 
Um, so, um, to describe the method, it's very seldom that we start out by capturing them themselves. I don't remember how to do it. Um, method of storage. Is this property field going to be stored as a vector or as a raster? So is our elevation going to be stored as points or is it going to be stored as lines or is it going to be stored as a property field or as a raster layer? Preferred coordinate system, coordinate reference system as well our entities. Property domain, so it, is it integer? Basically, that is almost always a number. It is always a number. Uh, so is it a integer? So typically a categorical. Um, in the video on making a map of QGIS, I talked about a land cover classes, class one, two, three. Um, or is it a decimal value? So meters, 2.6 meters above sea level decimal values. And again, uh, this attribute is that what is the temperature of that so if you have meters above sea level well, it changes as the sea level rises slowly but that's relatively slowly um but of course if it was temperature it would vary over day um so it, they also have some temporality remember again that all of these blue ones are the ones that you use in when you start creating your data. So this is our schema. These the blue ones is what goes into the schema directly. And you so when you start creating your database or your data, you look for the blue ones. So whew, that was a um a long, long little description of um of how to uh, define help you through the process of going from your world of observation from its phenomena through your lens of purpose and your approach in order to know, oh, might be a good idea to think about roads like this. That generates your world of discourse. These two things, your world of discourse and your schema, are really well documented in, uh, oh, I recommend that you use a template. Many organizations have their own template. This is just one I have made, um, and it is in the link in the description. So, hope that um, you like this video. Hope that it helps you through this process. It's a really, um, it's a, it's a process that is difficult to undertake the first time. You know, you what. What do I, do I have to be this particular things or can this nah well a road is a road blah blah um and that is only something that comes through experience um so as a beginner try and stick to being a bit meticulous say okay go through a list of some kind to help you with the structure so hope you liked it hope to see you in another video bye.